Well, welcome back to our series, just walking through the people of Proverbs or the people types in Proverbs. And before we do anything else, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace to us in Christ. We thank you for your incredible grace to us in giving us your word. And we thank you for the book of Proverbs that shows us in really practical ways what it looks like to follow you and to follow after your wisdom. And so we pray that you would be our teacher and help us understand your word that we might walk in your ways. And we ask in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Well, we've talked a lot about wisdom as we've looked at the people in Proverbs. What's the goal of wisdom? Well, the goal of wisdom simply is to follow and know the God who gives wisdom. It's to be godly, to know and follow him. So a few phrases. What do you think when you hear phrases like this? Like, I'm not into doctrine, I just love Jesus. Or, I'm no theologian, I just want to follow Jesus. Or, doctrine divides, love unites. Or, I just want to worship, not listen to another lecture. So, what do you think? Is love for God and worship and living as a follower of Jesus, is it divorced from doctrine, teaching, learning, considering, thinking? How do those things mesh together? Well, I hope that by the time we're done, we have a little better sense of the answer to that question. Let's, let's look at a couple passages in Proverbs that will touch on the answer to that question as well. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. What's the key thing here? Well, I think you see that, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom, which implies what? Well, it implies that it's my theology of God that matters most. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. My theology of God that matters most. When I go to Scripture... The most important place to end when I finish reading scripture or studying it is this. What does this passage teach me about God? It's our theology that determines our actions, our thoughts, our reactions, our words. If I really fear God and have a deep and, and lasting reverence and awe for him, that makes a whole bunch of choices for me. It closes a bunch of doors and it opens a bunch of doors. I'm going to read another passage in Proverbs and ask you the same question. This is chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. What's the key thing here? Well, I think the key thing in that passage is that something is going to rule my life. Something is going to rule. It's either going to be my supposed wisdom or God's wisdom. It's going to be one or the other. Those are the only two options. What are the implications of both of those? If I trust my own heart, I think we've seen in the book of Proverbs, that's the very definition of fool. It invites ruin. It destroys relationships, makes me more and more arrogant in defiance of God. If I trust God's wisdom... I fill my mind with his words, his wisdom, and I trust it, and I let it govern my thinking and my decision-making. So one more time, it's my theology of God derived from Scripture that is the single most important thing that can be in my mind because that's the thing that determines my, again, my actions, my thoughts, my words, my reactions. So when I go to Scripture... Wherever I read or study, the most important thing to glean from it is this. What does this text tell me about God? And then, what am I going to do about it? So, there are two types of theology. Bear with me here. I know this may not be the most exciting thing you could you know, imagine thinking about. Two types of theology. I'll explain why it matters here. 
You may have heard these terms, systematic theology and biblical theology. What in the world are they? Why am I bringing them up here and who cares anyway? Well, systematic theology very simply is taking what scripture says about certain topics and putting that in outline form. Systematic theology answers the question, what does the Bible say about fill in the blank? What does the Bible teach about God? What's the Bible say about Jesus? What's the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? What's the Bible teach about sin? What does the Bible teach about Satan? What's the Bible teach about angels, about the church, whatever else? That's systematic theology is very helpful, very important. What about biblical theology? What is that? Well, biblical theology answers a question too. Biblical theology answers questions like, when Moses wrote, what did he know about God? Or what is revealed about God in Moses' writings? Or the writers of the Psalms, what did they understand about salvation? Or what was Paul's theology of salvation? Or what was John's theology of the church or of salvation or whatever else? So it's those kind of questions, things like that. So we're gonna do just a little bit of biblical theology in this lesson. We've looked at the people types in Proverbs. Now we want to see the most important person in Proverbs, and that's obviously God. What does the book of Proverbs teach us about God? The answer to that question is way more than we could cover in this lesson. We're just going to scratch the surface. More than anything else, I want to give you maybe a, a, a different way to read the book of Proverbs, to understand it. A way that you can glean from it the knowledge of God, which is the most important thing to get out of the book. So, what are some of the things that we learn about God from the Bible? Well, things like who he is, and then in his sight, who we are, what his will is, how we respond to that, what God's provisions are for our needs, etc., etc. Proverbs doesn't reveal everything about God. Again, it takes the whole Bible to give us the whole picture of God's revelation to us. But what Proverbs does reveal in the context of the book of Proverbs, is intended to shape our lives toward godly character. So, let's look at a small sample. How is God portrayed in Proverbs? And we want to do this by looking at a, a verse or two in Proverbs, and then we'll look at what the characteristic is that's revealed there, and then we'll talk about how does this encourage godly character? What do I do about that? How am I supposed to understand that? Okay, so here we go. We'll start with Proverbs 2, verse 6. Proverbs 2, 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. What's the characteristic there? Well, God is the source and the giver of wisdom. You know, the, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. God the source and giver of wisdom and understanding. What do I do with that? How does that encourage godly character? Well, the wise person, which is what Proverbs always encourages us to be, the wise person reads that verse, stops and thinks about that, understands that, okay, the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. Words come from mouths. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. i got to spend time reflecting on God's words. The wise person sees that and thinks, i got to get God's words in my mind and spend a lot of time just thinking about them because that's going to affect the choices that I make and my actions, reactions, words, on and on. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. So what's that say? Well, clearly God disciplines his people. That He does that. God disciplines his people as necessary. It also likens him to a father. You know, as a, uh, the Lord reproves him whom he loves, as a father, the son in whom he delights. So, a few things. We understand that God disciplines those whom he loves. The writer of Hebrews talks about that as well. So, from that, we can glean that, you know, maybe if there's hard things going on in my life, I need to think about that. Is this God's fatherly discipline? If it is... That changes my whole perspective on it. And beyond that, uh, uh, we could say this, that gives, again, again, a glimpse of the concept of God as Father, which is not common in the Old Testament. It's a few places, but it's not common. 
gives another glimpse of God as Father, and that's important. And then we could, we could look at it like this, that a father, seeing those words and reflecting on those words, might say, that's how God parents Israel as a father. I need to do the same with my children, that loving, fatherly discipline. So that's another way that we can reflect on that. Uh, Proverbs 3, verses 19 and 20. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. Well, what's that tell us? The characteristic there that God is the wise and omniscient creator. God's revealed here as the wise and sovereign creator. By his wisdom, he ordered everything in creation. So that's why it doesn't break down into chaos. So the wise person will see that and stop and think, if that's how God created, and if his wisdom is built into the very structure of the universe, then the best possible way for me to live is by the wisdom of God as it's revealed in his word. We can go to Proverbs 6, now 16 through 19. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Well, what do we pull out of there? God hates certain things, and we can see those listed there. Well, the, the interesting thing about this passage, this six things, no seven, that's a, a fairly common um, literary device or structure in the Hebrew wisdom literature. What it does is it points to the last thing. That's how they understood it. It points to the last thing on the list. So that's how they would have understood it. They would have known, yeah, the first six things clearly, yeah, God hates those things, no question. But the seventh, whoa, that, that one was kind of unexpected. You know, the seventh is meant to fo uh, give us a, a focus on that last thing there. Kind of pulls us up short. I hadn't thought about that one. One who sows discord among brothers. God hates things that divide his covenant people. God takes a dim view of one who sows discord. He delights in the real genuine unity of his people. So the wise person is going to understand that. Oh, okay. One who sows discord among people, that's a particular specific thing that God really despises. He delights in the unity of his covenant people. Proverbs, two verses here. Proverbs 11, verse 20. Proverbs 11, verse 20. Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. And then Proverbs 12, verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Well, we could say from there that God is faithful and trustworthy. And we could look at that. How does that encourage godly character? Well, we can say that God is concerned with what's in the heart. God is concerned with what's in the heart. If you look at chapter 12 in Proverbs, verses 15 through 23, you'll see that each verse there contains a real sharp contrast. So verse 22 there is a, a parallel verse to chapter 11, verse 20. Verse 23 in Proverbs chapter 12 talks about the heart of fools. Going back to Proverbs 11, 20, those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord. God despises the crooked of heart, and that manifests itself, or that shows up in the lying lips of chapter 12, verse 22. Since God is faithful and trustworthy, as a wise person, I should think about that, and I should display those same characteristics. If there's any way that I'm displaying a crooked heart or, or lying lips, that needs to go. It just needs to go. Proverbs 15, verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked 
is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is, is acceptable to him. So there's a parallel verse to that in chapter 21, verse 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with evil intent? What can we say? What's a characteristic of God from those two verses? We could say that God despises false worship, despises false worship, hollow phony, a hypocritical false worship, what's it do? It just makes God look small. That's what it does. You know, it doesn't make him look majestic and perfect and high and holy to others. It just makes him look small. So bring honest, real worship to God. You know, even if all you can do is pray at the moment. You know, again, Proverbs 15, verse 8 the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is acceptable to him. That's all you can do. That's okay. That's acceptable worship. Just make sure that is real and honest. Proverbs 16, uh, verse 1 and verse 9. Proverbs 16, verse 1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. And then verse 9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes the steps. What's that say? What's that say about God, those two verses? Well, God is sovereign over all mankind. It does say that. God is sovereign over all mankind, including you know, all of his creation, including specifically man. It points that out. But even more than that, even more specifically, our, our, our plans, our lives, he reserves the right to intervene in any of our lives, in any of our plans. And the wise person gets that. The wise person makes plans. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. But takes into account the sovereignty of God. It's just like James said in James 4.15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Proverbs shows God to be the sovereign ruler of the universe who has the right to intervene where and when he pleases. And so we have to think about that in terms of our lives. A couple more here. Proverbs 16, verse 2. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. The Lord weighs the spirit. What can we say? God is omniscient, just like Hebrews 4.13 says, that God sees all the way down into the heart. He does. He sees all the way down into the human heart. The wise person gets that and so rejects certain thoughts. I'm not going to think about this because that doesn't please God. The wise person doesn't let his or her mind wander to places that he or she clearly knows are not God's best, not God's will. Well, one more here, Proverbs 16, verse 11. A just balance and scales are the Lord's. All the weights in the bag are his work. What do we say about God? God is just. He's a God of integrity, a God of justice and integrity. So God is just. It's not, justice is not just something that God does, but it's an attribute of his. It's what he is. Because God is just, the wise person thinks about that and says, I am not going to act unjustly. In fact, more than that, I'm going to seek justice. So again, that's just a little overview of, of a way that we can read Proverbs and, and glean from it characteristics of God. And then what do we do with it based on what we see? <clears throat> so Dan Phillips, <clears throat> who wrote an excellent book <clears throat> excuse me, on Proverbs, called The Wisdom of God in Proverbs, he says that the goal of teaching wisdom, <clears throat> of communicating God's word, is cultivating a vital relationship with God. This, Solomon says, is why he taught what he taught, that his son would come to trust in the Lord, nourished by the faith-producing words of Solomon, Unquote. One phrase, back to in this quote from Dan Phillips, this Solomon says is why he taught what he taught, that his son would come to trust in the Lord, nourished by the faith-producing words of Solomon. So, Solomon's son. The book of Proverbs is essentially a father exhorting his son to live his life 
following the wisdom of God. That's what the book of Proverbs is. Follow the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of the world. Just a few examples here. Look at uh, Proverbs 1, verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Forsake not your mother's teaching. Chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments within you. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Chapter 4, verse 1. My son, or hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. Chapter 5, verse 1. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. I think you get the point. Solomon's son. Solomon's son. Who was Solomon's son? Well, according to 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3, King Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You just have to assume that there were a whole lot of little Solomons running around. Lots of babies with 700 wives and 300 concubines, probably lots of kids. But it's really interesting, though, that there's only one named in Scripture. Only one. The only one that we ever hear anything about is a son of Solomon's named Rehoboam. Probably his oldest son, since he succeeded Solomon to the throne of Israel. Probably, but we don't know that for sure, but it's likely. You know, that's typically how things were done. But he's the only child of Solomon that's ever named in the Scripture. Did he do that? You know, Solomon obviously spent a lot of time writing Proverbs, teaching his son or son's wisdom. Did he do that? Did he do what his dad taught him in Proverbs? And the answer is, well, maybe for a while, but then, well, he didn't. And then later, maybe he kind of did again. I mean, maybe mostly or not. Well, let's see what happened in Solomon's son's life as we finish out this lesson. This is really the one that Proverbs was written to. This is the son of Solomon who succeeded him on the throne, right? If any one of his sons should have gleaned and grasped wisdom, it should be this one. So let's see what happened in Solomon's son's life. Rehoboam, son of Solomon, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. If only both Solomon and Rehoboam had grasped the last part of that, length of days, years of life and peace they will add to you. Neither one of them finished out in peace. Here's the home that Rehoboam grew up in. 1 Kings 10, verses 23 and 24. Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom, and the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. So Rehoboam watched his father Solomon entertain these world rulers who came to seek his wisdom. He grew up hearing wisdom every single day. He grew up surrounded by unimaginable wealth and privilege. He grew up watching his father tax his own people heavily to fund an equally unimaginably expensive kingdom. He grew up watching his father compelling the Israelites into forced labor to do the work of supporting this lavish, extensive, enormous royal household with all the wives and concubines and palaces and building projects and lavish state dinners and massive army and on and on and on. Rehoboam saw that day after day. He could have seen the condition of his people knowing he would succeed his father as king, seeing them subjected to forced labor for the sake of King Solomon, he could have thought maybe about, you know, once I take the throne, how am I going to rule? Am I going to continue this? Is this right? How am I going to respond to their complaints? Then maybe he would have been ready to institute some reforms, maybe? Maybe take some prompt action when he gained the throne? 
maybe? He could have thought like that. Well, he took the throne at age 41, in the prime of life. I mean, this was not a kid, who, this was not a teenager who took the throne. This was a 41-year-old man who had observed his, his father Solomon over four decades. Four decades he's had to absorb the wisdom of God, to seek the Lord himself, to, to be among the people and learn their condition. Four decades of preparation to be a wise and godly king. Well, he's, he's crowned as king. The coronation takes place in a city called Shechem, which is north, a ways north of Jerusalem. You see that in 1 Kings 12, verse 1. And a guy after that named Jeroboam shows up sometime after the coronation. Jeroboam was the former head under King Solomon of forced labor in Israel. Okay, So he comes to Rehoboam and he says this, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. Right there. There's an opportunity to win the hearts of his people. Right there. Uh, an opportunity to seek the Lord, to respond wisely. He could have said, okay, let me think about that. Let me pray about that. Let me seek the Lord's wisdom. Let me consult priests and prophets, and I'll get back to you with an answer. He had an opportunity with a few words to knit their hearts of his. As Jeroboam said, Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. But Rehoboam seems kind of rattled, kind of unprepared for this, not sure what to do. Uh, one writer said years ago of Rehoboam, he said he had the heart of a child with the years of a man. In 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 6, Rehoboam, he, he consults the older men, the men who were Solomon's advisors, and they gave him simple, sound, and wise counsel. Here's what they said. If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. The brand new king could not get off to a better start than that. To take their counsel, though, would have forced Rehoboam to think of himself as their servant, as their shepherd, which was what a godly king in Israel was supposed to be anyway, was supposed to think of himself as a shepherd. It seems that he was not willing to do that. So what Rehoboam does is he turns to his friends, turns to his buddies, the guys around him who always told him what he wanted to hear. These were young men who had probably grown up again with him, accustomed to the luxuries of royal court life under Solomon's reign and the harsh conditions of the people that meant nothing to them. Basically, their counsel was this Rehoboam, and you go tell those people that you are the man. That's essentially what they say. Here's what they say. And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus shall you say to them, My little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. And now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. You know, he was saying, if you thought my father was the man, you ain't seen nothing yet. You've never seen power like you're going to see now. You've never seen discipline like you're going to see now. Let's go back to some words that Rehoboam heard from his father Solomon some years before this. Proverbs 13, verse 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Well, Rehoboam walked with fools and he became a fool. The people, as you might expect, they reject Rehoboam. They say, well, we're not going to have anything to do with that. You know, the cry is to your tents, O Israel. So Rehoboam sends out a guy named Adoram. Adoram 
was, according to uh, 1 Kings 12, verse 18, the first part of that verse, he was taskmaster over the forced labors. So he was the guy, Adorn was the guy that Rehoboam uh, appointed to be head over forced labor. So he sends him out to whip these people into shape, to get the forced labor program going again, because we got palaces to build, we got things to do, I need massive amounts of food every day, get those people going again, and let's get this kingdom up and running. Well, Adoram goes out, and he is recognized and taken and brutally killed. And Rehoboam turns and runs, according to chapter 12, verse 18 again, and Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot, and flee to Israel. Again, like this older writer said, he had the heart of a child with the years of a man. The kingdom divides, and to summarize the rest of Israel's history, it's a mess from this point on. It's just a train wreck. Second Chronicles chapters 11 and 12 fills in some gaps for us of, of Rehoboam's history, some of the later history, just two things that touch on here. Rehoboam he turns and runs back to Jerusalem where it's safe, where he can be inside the palace and lock the gates, lock the wall, the doors. Things finally settle down, and you know it went okay for a while. Uh, 2 Chronicles eleven seventeen says, They, the priests and Levites, strengthened the kingdom of Judah, and for three years they made Rehoboam the son of Solomon secure. For they walked for three years in the way of David and Solomon. But only for three years. So you get to Second Chronicles 12, verse 1. When the rule of Rehoboam was established and he was strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. So God brings an enemy nation against Jerusalem and they wreak havoc for a while. But then according to Second Chronicles 12, verse 12, and when he, Rehoboam, humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him so as not to make a complete destruction. Moreover, conditions were good in Judah. But that didn't last either. That didn't last either. Here's the last word on Rehoboam's life and reign. Second Chronicles 12, 14. And he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord did not set his heart to seek the Lord. What's the bottom line here? Rehoboam didn't fear God. Go back to Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Rehoboam, Rehoboam did not fear God. He didn't set his heart to fear God, to reverence him, and then live that out by living out wisdom, because that's what wisdom is. It's living out the fear of God. So we started with this. We started with this. It's my theology of God derived from Scripture that is the single most important thing that I can have in my mind, because that's the thing that determines my actions and reactions and thoughts and words. So when I go to Scripture, wherever I read and study, the most important thing to glean from it is this. What does this text tell me about God, and what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do about it? So that's my encouragement as we end this lesson. As you read through the book of Proverbs, read it to know and fear and love and follow the God who is your Redeemer, because we don't want to end up becoming a fool like Rehoboam did. We want to be just the opposite. So we want to read the book of Proverbs maybe a little differently than we have before. Read it to see who God is, to know him, and to glean that from the book. Well, thank you again for stopping by, and we'll catch you as we finish up this series next time. Thanks.